Welcome to the third episode of the Pine Mountain Sessions at Home. This is Greg Abernathy, the director of Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. We are proud to be continuing the long tradition in Kentucky of a partnership between art and conservation. It's a powerful partnership that we at KNLT feel is essential to our efforts to protect, connect, and restore wildlands. As we celebrate our 25th anniversary, we continue to work to protect additional wildlands along Pine Mountain and throughout the Commonwealth. While we cannot come together to celebrate, we plan to continue to bring you unique online content so we can remain connected. Stay tuned for new episodes over the summer, and please help spread the word on KNLT and all the talented artists taking part in this series. Stay healthy, friends, and enjoy the show. I'm here uh, in the porch of the big cabin, Fox Hollow Farm, uh, just outside of Louisville, and been back home for about a month now. I was living in Ireland for what was supposed to be a year-long fellowship, studying uh, brain health and dementia, and about mid-April it seemed like it was time to come home, so um, yeah, sad to pack up my life there in Dublin and leave my friends. But it's so nice to be home, close to people, close to all my people, friends and family, and, uh, and to all of you. So, um, this first song I'm going to play is called Simple Life, and I wrote it several years ago. It's really just about how few things, uh, realizing how, many, how few things I need in my life to be happy and make it. Uh, it's called Simple Life.
buzz, buzz, buzz. We've got the wood bees, we've got the chickens. They're all joining us today. <laughs> Got a short one for the kitties. One of the oldest stories in song, um, found all the way back up into the 1500s and before the story of the gentleman frog and the and the lady mouse. This one, this version is Kitty Alone. The lady mouse lived in the mill. Kitty alone. Kitty alone. The lady mouse lived in the mill. Kitty alone and I. Lady Mouse lived in the mill, the gentleman frog lived in the well. Rock my carry kitty alone, kitty alone, and I. Well, he wrote till he came to Miss Mousie's door, kitty alone, kitty alone. He wrote till he came to Miss Mousie's door, kitty alone, and I. Wrote till he came to Miss Mousie's door, where he'd been many times before. Rock my carry kitty alone, kitty alone, and I. He took Miss Mousie on his knee, kitty alone, kitty alone. He took Miss Mousie on his knee, kitty alone, and I. He took Miss Mousie on his knee, said Miss Mousie, will you marry me? Rock my carry, kitty alone, kitty alone, and I. Well, they all came a-tumbling down the brook, kitty alone, kitty alone. They all came a-tumbling down the brook, kitty alone, and I. They all came a-tumbling down the brook, the old duck swallowed them down her crook. Buck my carry kitty alone, kitty alone, and I. Thanks to Mr. Chicken for the backup. I'll see you later. This next song became a lot more special to me when I was living abroad and just um, thinking of the songs that make me feel closer to home, and this was one of them. It's by Tom T. Hall. It's called. Uh, Georgia, I love your big magnolia trees. Texas, I love to feel your fairy breeze. Oh, Tennessee, you made me who I am today. Oh, but it's got to be Kentucky for me. to be Kentucky 
NLT for having me. Thanks, Pine Mountain, for being beautiful. <laughs> Hello, I'm Silas House. I'm a novelist and I'm really proud to be here for the Pine Mountain Sessions at home. I'm always proud to be involved with the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust in any way that I can. I so appreciate the great work that they do to preserve the wild places and um, I hope you will support them in any way that you can. I'm going to read to you uh, from my 2005 novel, The Cold Tattoo. Uh, this book has been on my mind a lot lately because it's uh, being reissued along with my uh, all three of my first books. Uh, my trilogy uh, will be out in July in really beautiful new editions. Um, and so in The Cold Tattoo, uh, one of the aspects of the book is about the way that Appalachian people started to fight back to protect their land in the 1960s. Um, and in this scene, I wanted to draw a particular focus onto the way that women were at the forefront of that movement, as they uh, so often are in social justice movements. And so uh, you'll see that happening in this scene from the cold tattoo. They stood on the mountain with their arms interlocked, their jaws tightening against the cold, their eyes hard and unblinking. There was only Anna, Easter, and Sophie. Easter wondered what the driver of the dozer thought of them. Here was Anna, seven months pregnant, but looking as if she could sit down and have the baby at any moment. Sophie, who was not more than five feet tall, even with her beehive hair. And Easter herself, could he see that the grief of the last few years had thinned her, had cleaned her completely out? Or could he see that this same grief had made her stronger somehow, had made her more adamant than ever to fight for what was hers, to keep alive all of her family that she could. Did he see in all three of the women's faces that they would not surrender their land? Easter looked at him sitting up there, his face dark because of the morning's new sun behind him, and knew that there was no way he could realize that Sophie had the courage to kill anybody that crossed her family, despite her thin wrist and kind eyes. There was no way he could fathom the rage that Anna was able to unloose when the need arose. It seemed more likely that he saw three women and found this laughable. He tapped the gas and a metal lid lifted on the exhaust pipe to allow three blasts of black smoke to burst out onto the morning air. The lid closed again and rattled there atop the pipe with thin wisps of smoke seeping out around its edges. The doors of the Ford came open and two men stepped out, flicking cigarettes off into the woods. The women held on to one another's arms more tightly, pulling themselves together into a hole. As the men came closer, Easter felt the mountain behind her, its presence so big and real that she thought she could feel it breathing, something ancient and alive. Let's go, Easter said. They moved forward together then, climbed into the dozer scoop without difficulty, settling in it as if it was a wide, deep porch swing. They sat back against the cold metal. Easter brought her hands up and saw red soil on her palms like clots of blood. Within the scoop, they could feel the vibration of the motor. The driver hollered, but they couldn't make out his words, so he tapped the gas again to startle them. Easter flinched at the sudden jolt but stilled herself against the dozer bucket. There was no way she was going to move now. More hollering, and then the scoop lifted and swung out, dumping them onto the ground in front of the dozer. Easter fell on all fours and saw Sophie tumbling down to land beside her. But Easter, but Anna held on to the edges of the scoop, wedging herself in, refusing to let go. Easter looked back at the mountain, its winter trees black and skeletal. She thought the mountain might rise up and avenge them. She thought of the birds that were usually gathered here and figured they had moved back into the deepest parts of the forest. The driver brought the scoop down, a great heaviness being released. When it hit the ground, Easter could feel the impact in her ankles and up the backs of her calves. Sophie was beside her, hanging onto her arm, hollering words that were lost. Anna still had her feet firmly planted against the edge of the scoop, 
her back pressed against the metal. There was nothing to read on her face. She had her eyes closed, and Easter thought she might be praying. The driver swung the scoop in the air, brought it down again, the sound of it striking the ground, a dull, wide vibration through the earth. And then Aneth was tumbling out of the scoop, rolling toward them with her arms out to soften the blow. Easter pulled her up onto her lap, wiping dirt away from her sister's face. I'm all right, Aneth said, pushing her away. Get away. Don't let them think they've hurt me. But the baby, Easter said, I want you to go back to the house. If you think I'd leave now, you're crazy, Aneth said. Easter took in everything, in flashes, as if her eyes closed between images, the dozer rolling toward them now, chunks of dirt caught in the metal tracking that wound about the wheels, the trees, their limbs bending down in a slight breeze, as if leaning over to watch the action below, the sky gray and low, and then, as the dozer rode closer and closer, they all knew what they had to do. They interlocked their arms and sat down. The driver didn't stop until he was so close that Easter could smell the soil caked across the bottom of the scoop. So thanks again for tuning in tonight, and please support the efforts of Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. Thanks so much for being here. I'm going to do a couple songs for uh, KNLT, Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. And uh, really love the work they've been doing, preserving uh, wild lands in Kentucky. And this is a song that I wrote after John Prine died. And uh, it's Benny's favorite song <laughs> so far. Um, yeah, I had these sort of uh, John Prine inspired verses and then I don't know how it popped in my head, but uh, Serenity, Serenity Now as the chorus, I guess, came from uh, the, the uh, uh, Seinfeld episode where George Costanza's father um, gets a mantra given to him to help calm him down in you know stressful everyday situations, and but it quickly becomes more like a curse for him. You know, it goes from serenity now to serenity now. <laughs> so <clears throat> maybe you've seen it, maybe not. Either way. Apocalypse peaches close all the precincts and open the beaches. Serenity now, serenity now. Doomsday preppers hoarding guns and knives. We grow peppers and squash, cilantro and chives. Serenity now. Serenity now. Blue blossoms tremble on red bud boughs. Can we just let go? Let the bees buzz around Serenity now Serenity now Can we just let the bees buzz around I stood for a while, then I left that room. I put on your first record and cried under the moon. Serenity now. Serenity now. 
serenity now. Now line his bare feet sticking out the recliner. I've never seen a curve and arch more finer serenity now. Joy Dogs, which was <laughs> heavily uh, borrowed from Marianne from her poetry. I like to call it a collaboration, but I guess it was just me like going through and <laughs> rating her book called Joy Dog. <clears throat> Into the fall again It was just you and me What it was we missed The slanted light comes back to speed The long light longing Just ahead of time Touching spires of fire stars A dragonfly sun its wings on a rock Gentle living air. The world is on fire. Now your lungs are too. You're listening to Fats Domino. Comes to them on the wind. 
grandmother barking at the edge of the woods. Barking maniacal gladness of little squirrels and rabbits. Little things to chase and kill. Chase and kill. These days we've been running. the seams when the lights in their eyes rolling in dark dreams under the shade when it's hot fire when it's cold wild when we're young oh, fire when we're old we go running with the joy dog running with the joy Hi, my name is Rebecca Gale Howell, and I want to thank you for joining us as we celebrate and support Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. I want to share with you a couple of poems that have been good teachers to me during these quarantine days. The first is by Thomas Merton. He was a Trappist monk who made his home up the road here near Bardstown at the Abbey of Gethsemane um, and loved, loved his Kentucky. This poem is called Pastora. Earth's amniotic atmosphere, wherein winged clouds arc over us, cleaves to the turning globe like flesh to feed and light and cover us. Above the building stands the flesh, blue, translucent, and electric, wherein birds fly and glide and sing, beasts move, Trees grow, all geocentric. Air mantles us and binds us in and carries words about the bone. If air is flesh, then earth is bone, and neither thus will live alone. Coordinating earth and air, we line the ground and plant the seeds and tend the plants and graze the beasts and wander with them here and there with sounds and gesture, words and prayer. I love how this poem imagines the earth as a mother, not as a cliche or a metaphor, but as an actual mother who's taking care of us and gives us not only what we need, but what we want, what we dream, like words, like gestures, like prayers. This image of our membership being a part of a mother's wisdom uh, has been really carrying me through. Another poem that speaks to it is by Anne Sexton. Sexton was a mother and a wife. She made her home in Massachusetts. She, like Merton, knew something about isolation, knew something about the loneliness of uh, not being able to connect. This poem was published after her death. It's called Yellow. When they turn the sun on again, I'll plant children under it. I'll light up my soul with a match and let it sing. I'll take my mother and soap her up. I'll take my bones and polish them. 
I'll vacuum up my stale hair. I'll pay all my neighbors bad debts. I'll write a poem called Yellow and put my lips down to drink it up. I'll feed myself spoonfuls of heat and everyone will be home playing with their wings and the planet will shudder with all those smiles and there will be no poison anywhere, no plague in the sky and there will be a mother broth for all of the people and we will never die, not one of us. We'll go on, won't we? I love this poem because it teaches me to send my imagination out farther than my own body can go. It teaches me to remember delight and that joy is one of the great things that this earth gives us. Not just as a bundle, not just as a gift, but as sustenance. I'll finish with a poem of my own. This is from my first book, which was called Render. And it takes as its point of imaginative departure um, the fact that when cows calve, uh, when a cow is calving, she'll, she'll go off by herself um, as far as, as she can from the herd and because she knows that she can't protect herself or her calf if predators come. So she'll give birth and then after she does, she will stay there and lick the calf clean of its smell so that uh, when it's ready to walk, they can travel safely. This poem imagines a human in that situation and uh, is asking questions about what it means to be born again. A brief atlas for return. When the herd arrives, you will be lost in the field without the cover of trees. Your days wet and natal with wide heat. Your sense absent. Your drought throat. Behold their approach. Silence of their silence, how they rend with the soul, with the hooves smelling blood guilt seeped underneath how they will not leave what was abandoned, how they circle you, mother tongues upon your forehead, your neck, your back and bold chest anointing you, new and without scent, without name. Hello, my name's Joe Manning. Uh, thank you for joining me in my home office. Um, I live in South Louisville with my family I grew up in Louisville, and I'm very, very grateful to KNLT for inviting me to uh, to be here today, especially in such distinguished company as this. So uh, I'm going to play a couple tunes for you, um, and I hope you enjoy them. Thanks. This first song is a tune called uh, Echo Lake. It's a song that I perform um, with a band that I'm in called Giant Dunes, um, and we'll have a record out later this year. <coughs> Here's a song called Echo Lake. If you could take one day If you could just take the whole
back to Echo Lake. From the peak I point 500 miles. There have I been The wild geese are not discouraged By what they must leave or have to take They may cry but they do not mourn a song called Echo Lake. Uh, let's see. Now I'd like to do um, a song called Amigo that I submitted to the Pine Mountain Sessions, which is a really fantastic project mounted by my friend Daniel Martin Moore. Um, some of you will be familiar with it, but if you're not familiar with it, go check it out. All the uh, It's uh, in support of Kentucky Natural Lands Trust and Pine Mountain, and uh, uh, it's a fantastic project. You 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 will be dazzled by the by the uh, brilliance of of the contributors. Really special. So I was glad again to be uh, included in such august company. Um, let's see. This is a tune called Amigo. I usually sing this song with my buddy Glenn uh, Denninger, whom I've not seen much during the quarantine. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are missing some of your friends and family as well, but uh, I hope that, that you are healthy and well and in good company wherever you find yourselves today. Okay, a song called Amigo here. It's, a kind of, it's an older, older tune I wrote many years ago. the train just like we planned down to Mexico and walk for days in the desert like bandits you'll be lefty and I'll be poncho unless we freeze our little asses off in a train yard outside Chicago and pack it up call it off and trade it in for cheap drinks and dry sock cable TV and good intentions are always enough for you and me the bells are ringing the clocks are wrong And now with winter coming We call to ourselves All that we need And who knew We'd be waiting so long Out in the car And who knew That being patient Could be so hard We did least of all Above your 
bed And now that we know nothing will destroy us but ourselves I promise we'll be safe Thanks so much for listening, and thanks to KNLT for having me. Uh, y'all take care of yourselves out there. <laughs>